Hey everybody, welcome back to HPC Tech Shorts, the engineering water cooler here in AWS. Uh, this week we're joined by Jeff Enos uh, uh, and Dan Gerlank from a company called Ampersand, um, who work in the TV advertising analytics space, and they're gonna they're gonna explain that in a lot better way than I can in a minute. Um, they just did it. They 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 they've, they've become a, a pretty big customer of AWS Batch uh, in recent times, and they've got some. They've got some uh, great insight into the bits that made it work really well for them, and you know how they've worked around some of the you know some of the curveballs that, that their workloads threw them while they're on their on their way to trying to implement that. Um, they've got a, a pretty interesting story to tell. So uh, anyway, so I'll bring them in now. Uh, I hope everybody gets a lot out of the conversation. Hey, Dan and Jeff, thank you for joining us. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks for having us. Um, now. Uh, Dan, you're the senior director of data science, and so I'm kind of going to expect that you know what your data science is in service of. So, what is Hope so. what is that? Yeah, well, <laughs> what does ampersand do? Yeah, so ampersand's actually been around for about over thirty years, and it started out actually as a company called National Cable Communications. And historically, you could think of it as if you wanted to run a television ad across the entire U.S. They had relationships basically with every cable company or direct TV now with Verizon, AT&T. So you can go to one place instead of having to go to every cable company network separately. Hmm. But also with that, now there's also insight into all of the different audiences and what these are going to look like across the entire country. And so... Because the audiences are presumably, it's much more segmented and much more complicated understanding of audiences now, right? Yeah, and especially with increasingly now, historically, Nielsen has been the provider of what these audiences look like, but now there's additionally set-top box data that we are bringing in and we have from different cable companies and other, like Verizon as well. So... Ampersand is probably one of the only places that's going to have all this information and can help you figure Got out it. how we reach these audiences most effectively and then execute on that. Got it. And so, and, and now, you know, the workload that you guys are doing using Batch and, and, and you're using absolutely a whole bunch of other services as well. Um, the workload you're using, you, you, you're running, what, what's the workload about? Like, what's the tin tax of that workload? So really what we're doing with our, our batch jobs is we're, we're, you know, you know, we're taking all the historical data that we need to estimate our models for predicting you know, future, future TV viewership, which is the core of what you know, we need to do in data science. Um, and we're doing that with a fairly complex uh, methodology using fully Bayesian hidden Markov models. Um, what makes it uh, sort of a big batch problem is that because the model is so complex, we have to estimate it on smaller categories of data. So we take our large data set, we need to chop it up into hundreds of thousands of pieces and estimate models separately on each one of those pieces. So when batch comes into play is we need to you know, have separate processes, separate container jobs for each one of those individual model fits. Uh, it's also where scalability comes into play because we want to do many of those at a time. Right. And and so the fact that you can do, I mean, you you did the the headline I know on the case study is that you did fifty thousand current current machine learning models in less than a day. What's what's that really mean to you compared to like what were you doing up until then? What what's like a weekly consumption in this context? How's that fit in? Well, we really weren't doing anything until then, right? Because in order to estimate the model, you know, we really do need to churn through all of those individual model fits. So this really was a requirement for us um, in order to solve the problem you know, as a whole. So a big reasoning in approaching the problem this way is that it allows us to combine our estimates in interesting ways. And basically you can calculate an arbitrary statistic on the combined estimates. And so this allows in terms of, and this is kind of what we're working on productionalizing going forward is how to integrate this into making you know, a better decision in terms of what 
where your campaign would run or what uh, your estimate might look like because traditionally, and this is also what we were doing before this is we were working with purely mean based estimates, but that's only, it gives you a single point and right. this gives us the entire effectively distribution of what outcomes are going to look like. You want to know where people are going to be so that you can put together a campaign that is going to reach the desired number of people that you want to see. Yeah. In. Is Ampersand the kind of company that would normally go out and buy an HPC cluster? So they have historic, so they did have some, there was a large on-premise or they had an on-premise data center actually. And I think they have had things like Nikiza uh, servers, things like that historically, but at right. this, this scale, I don't think it would have been possible to. Yeah. Right. Uh, um, I, one of my, one of my favorite, one of my favorite use cases of doing HPC in the cloud is a company in the U S called mm -hmm. big ass fans. Um, mm -hmm. They make very big fans as yeah. it turns out. And <laughs> who, um, who would have thought? yeah, yeah, exactly. And, 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 and what what was interesting about it is you could sort of think, okay, I, I understand how I understand how fans work. You know, they, they're, they're basically turbines, they've got propellers on them. You know, they're moving wind around, so they must be doing CFD on the fans and doing fluid dynamic simulations mm -hmm. to design better fans. So they do some of that, but what they actually use this for, um, they're when their sales folks go out into mm -hmm. the into the big warehouses that their fans are are going to cool. They can actually do a CFD simulation driven from some specs that the sales guy punches into mm. an iPad and, and it pushes it out into the cloud and they do a, mm. a really pretty big CFD simulation in 20 minutes uh, so that by the time he's finished having coffee with his client, he can actually give them three or four different models of what, you know, how to, how to lay out the fans in the factory to, to get the best cooling. It's, it's a, it's pretty neat because there's no way that you would have ever have justified going and spending a million bucks on an HPC cluster for something like that. But it's given them the effective ability to do all of the same things as though they yeah. had one. So yeah, I think, and I think our use case is similar in spirit is that if we didn't have the capability, we would have to do something else. Oops, there, this is the the sort of the sketch outline of the architecture, right? What are what were the important bits here that made all of the difference? I mean, really, for us, it's the it's the center of of you know the, the core of the batch process. Um, I mean, I can walk through briefly sort of what the overview is. It's a fairly uh, simple kind of task graph. There aren't a lot of dependencies here. Um, it's a very parallelized process. You know, first we take in the external data, import it into Redshift, um, unload it to uh, S3 uh, in Parquet files for each of the individual kind of partitions or chunks I was describing earlier. You know, and then it's it's right off to batch um, with, um, you know, uh, I think we're using now a, a maximum of 50,000 vCPUs um, in an auto scaling group that's configured with, you know, there are only three families there, but, you know, we're using, you know, a few dozen categories of instances uh, that we're using to ensure we get enough um, sort of spot uh, availability uh, right. in terms of our, our compute resources. Um, and then all of those, you know, individual model fits, 50,000 at a time, um, are executing in parallel until we reach, you know, we have a total of roughly 200,000 for this particular model we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, each one of those processes is, you know, serializing model output to S3, um, uh, you know, so that we, our data scientists can then consume, uh, or rather, you know, our, our uh, end users can consume, um, you know, those predictions that we're making. And, and what comes out the back is actually pretty much a finished product that's ready for interpretation by a human, or is there another stage of sort of post-processing that happens? Uh, th there's a little bit more to this picture that does involve additional AWS services. So, you know, those models, when they're output, uh, would then be deserialized, loaded into um, a ClickHouse server that's running on EKS, um, which is the, the data, you know, from which is then consumed by, you know, an API that we've written um, also running on EKS. Uh, that then serves out uh, information to uh, another application in the organization. We've, we've open sourced um, some of the uh, the tooling we've used to implement the hidden Markov model piece of the fitting process. Oh, okay, so right. it's, it's built on PyMC3 uh, or PyMC, I should say. Um, we um, actually part of using you know what's so attractive about using batch is that we don't really need to do too much work. We don't have to have too much custom code 
in order to manage the the workflow itself in terms of submitting jobs, queuing them up. Um, you know, we don't have to use any external you know type services like not external, but it, other AWS services like SQS. Um, we really just have to submit the jobs. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the open source work we've done has been more on the sort of the the statistical uh, sort of estimation tooling. Yeah. Okay. And the, by the way, when you when you did the when you sort of you know coming out of Redshift and the going into that input hmm. S three bucket, you, you fragmented all of the inputs and so forth. Was that like a really uniform fragmentation of the of the input space? Um, I was talking to a, a genomics customer the other day, and when they you know their approach when they wanted to get maximum use of spot hmm. was to fragment things into what looked like very uniform. Uh, workload chunks because it gave them a really easy ability to sort of do the the bin packing essentially you know that game of Tetris filling it up with CPUs to to get the maximum capacity is that similar to the approach you did you... yeah I think our approach is is probably even simpler you know because we don't have you know each of our uh, fitting processes can run you know using a single CPU physical CPU um, oh, wow. so all, all of our um, uh, you know, all of our, our partitions or chunks are, are are essentially uniform. So there's there's sort of a direct mapping between, you know, partitions uh, on S3 to fitting jobs, you know, each of which, like I said, consumes, um, at least today, uh, just a single vCPU. Well, I, I I can assure you that you're, the approach you've taken is no simpler than what the genomics people are doing. Like the bang on the it's same. A, um, it's a simpler game of Tetris, though. Yeah, yeah. But, I, I mean, you know, huge amounts of genomics is a lot of single core workloads just in massive, massive ensembles. So we see that that kind of stuff all the time. Oh, oh you go. Have I got the right browser tab open? This is the this is some of the work that you guys have open sourced. Yep. Yeah. yeah, so this is, that's one of the notebooks from the open one of our open source repos, PyMC 3 HMM, which provides the framework for fitting the kinds of models that we use within batch, although the specifics of how we implement it are specific to the kind of data and models we use at ampersand. This is the general uh, overall types of models we use internally. So this is ampersand's first open source repository. I, was what was what was your motivation behind that? Like, is that is that does that help you gain greater trust with your customer base, or is it is it more about contributing back into the data science domain? I think a combination of both. I don't think there's really much downside often to open sourcing the common components that yeah. folks can use, like you were saying, from customers being able to verify that we're doing something that is accepted by other people in the community also help other folks solving similar problems like PyMC gets used at NASA a lot of ecological work and also that's another area where these kinds of models come in handy uh, I think there's another there, there was a you know when we were discussing this earlier you guys also called out that there was a there was a, a batch monitoring utility that one of our solution architects mm -hmm. PY uh, came up with. Um, how, how was this involved in, in what you were doing? Yeah, so th this was really useful and, and PY helped us a lot um, just getting set up and also sort of um, by open sourcing this tool. So when we were initially uh, scaling up to our target of 50,000 concurrent jobs, um, there were, you know, there were some roadblocks, you know, things weren't scaling fast enough. We weren't, you know, getting uh, instances uh, created uh, fast enough, you know, so it would take a while to reach our our full kind of concurrency level. Um, what this provided was sort of a, a bird's eye view of kind of the key uh, points, the key bottlenecks, you know, that we might face. And, and you know, sure enough, you know, there was, for example, an issue with our kind of uh, our run task allowance, uh, which you know governs how quickly we can we can submit batch jobs, um, and so and therefore how quickly we could scale up. Um, so what this app does is it, you know, if, if you scroll down, we can see some of the, or yeah, that's a good, a good view. You know, it really gives you a bird's eye view of, of things like how many instance types do you, or how many instances of each type do you have? You know, how many run tasks, API calls per second, you know, have you seen? And so we were able to very quickly identify, you know, bottlenecks they where we were heading. Um, another cool thing about this app is that behind the scenes, you know, all of the uh, task data is going into DynamoDB. 
you know, which is very useful for us because we have so many jobs um, uh, right. so that we can sort of query, you know, more efficiently and get uh, our batch job state without making separate you know, batch API calls separately. I would say it took about a month of iteration uh, before we got to the the full the full capacity. Now, some of that time was sort of spent on our our own side, sort of you know dealing with with uh, issues with our application, you know, making sure we were provisioning sufficient IOPS on our con you know our container instances, um, so that we weren't having sort of issues that were specific just to you know our process because we have we have some. Uh, some uh, sort of high IO requirements uh, on our side, uh, but also just sort of doing iterations where, you know, like we, we would go back and forth between, uh, you know, this monitoring app and with uh, PY's team um, and the provision, you know, to, to make sure we were, were sufficiently provisioned. But, you know, over that time, you know, you know, we were, you know, also making improvements to our system, you know, learning more about AWS. And so by the end of that period, we were fully up and running. That uh, actually sounds like a pretty normal kind of curve in many respects. Also sounds like a good advertisement for yeah. go work with our awesome solution architects. Um, and PY is one of the more awesome solution architects that yeah. you guys you guys scored. <laughs> I guess also yeah, any folks are, are interested in working on large scale Bayesian modeling, um, reach out to me or Jeff. This is like we're these looking folks are, are interested in doing this kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. Sure. That's on your end, want to go work with PY, helping <laughs> folks to enable this kind of work. Do, um, gentlemen, thank you for coming along today. Really appreciate it. Um, thanks for having us. Yeah. Thanks. It's been fun. Uh, and for anybody else out there, uh, if there's other stuff that you want to see us dive deeper on uh, in future tech shorts, uh, come chase us on Twitter. Our DMs are open. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. All of the content that we do on the show is driven by uh, is driven by customer feedback. So, um, gentlemen, thanks very much. Hopefully, we'll see you soon for some other exciting discovery or cool thing that you've invented. Thanks a lot.